<laughs> okay, so I, th I think uh, we'll just start over. Uh, so we'll call to order the December 14, 2021 Public Works Committee meeting. Uh, roll call, please. Jenny Wook, Council. Bob Himes, Council. Tony Piasecki, Staff. Jeff Langhelm, Staff. Brent Ward, Staff. Maureen Whitaker, Staff. Jim Franich, Council. Um, approval of the November 9th minutes. Move to approve the November 9th minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So that brings us uh, no old business to schedule. So our first item of new business is excuse the emergency. Me. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. I, I do have one thing I'd like to talk about at the end of the meeting. So let's not rush off before we get to, we get, I get called on. Thank you. Okay. I think this is going to be a pretty fast meeting. So fine. Well, uh, plenty of time. Thank you. Okay. So uh, go ahead, Trent. Okay. Uh, thank you. So real briefly here, the emergency water intertide project. Um, this project began um, in 2020 and then for various reasons, uh, we lost some staff. Uh, we started some in-house design, lost staff, had to put it on hold. Um, council rebudgeted this project for this year, 2021. Um, and the intent of this project is to extend the city's dead-end water main, which currently exists in Canterwood Boulevard at the northerly end of the hospital, of uh, St. Anthony's Hospital. That's where our, our main ends. Um, and we were um, tasked with extending the main up to the Baker Way and Canterwood Boulevard intersection. And we have had conversations with Peninsula Light, who manages um, the uh, Canterwood water system up there and Washington Water, they both have water systems that have piping in that uh, intersection area. So we uh, began uh, conversations with both of them um, in regards to creating an, an emergency water intertie. So not a supplemental intertie, it would strictly be an emergency intertie to provide some redundancy to our water system because that area of, of our water system and city um, only has that area, I say, that uh, pressure zone only um, is only served by one uh, crossing on Highway 16, um, which fills the North Tank. So that, that upper pressure zone is, has only one supply um, direction, I'll call it. So we're trying to build some redundancy into our system in case there was some emergency that affected that um, connection um, and uh, still be able to supply water to the Gig Harbor North area and in particular the hospital. And Trent, just real quick, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna show the area we're talking about okay. specifically with the hospital and, and, and I'll click on the water purveyors real quick. So just to orient ourselves here, let me sh share this here. Uh, Trent, how much, how many gallons are in that tank? The North tank? Yeah. Um, 2.5 million gallons should be in that tank. So not, yeah. not all of it is usable. Correct. How, how much is, how much is usable? Oh goodness. I want to say about, well, I thought it was about 20% of it is usable. Maybe it's a is quarter. That, yeah. Is and that for pressure reasons or water quality reasons? Pressure reasons. Yeah. Once you go down below 20% in the uh, tank and the pressure gets too low? Yeah. Is there anything that can be done about increasing the pressure? No, it's all based, all of our water tanks are gravity based. They're all gravity flow. So you'd have to um, put a booster station in. Yeah. In order to, so yeah, we could, we could put a booster station in at the bottom of the tank. But that would take it, it, is it correct that there's only 270 gallons per minute being used up there? No, no. So I can keep rattling along here a little bit more. And so Jeff pulled up the, the map showing this 12 inch water main that extends 
uh, just north of the hospital property. It's, it's their property, but it, it extends to the extent of their property. Dead ends there. The idea was to have an inner tie up at Baker Way. So we would extend that 12 inch main up to the Baker Way intersection and then literally make a connection with the other two water purveyors, Peninsula Light and Washington Water. And so just so, real quick, the orange, hopefully it shows up as orange on your screen, is City Water, the red is Washington Water, and the blue is Peninsula Light Company representing Kennerwood uh, development. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop sharing. But that's what we're talking about. Well, so what the the, the tank is going up, um, I guess, to the east of isn't well number nine supposedly going up to, to the east of the hospital up at the other end of Bergen Boulevard. Um, well, number nine, potentially, we, we don't have a site for sure selected for well number nine but yes well, it'd be on the it'd be on the we intend it to be on the north tank side of sr16 well wh why are we extending the water line all the way up to baker way for the for gonna... a redundant supply as it just just for an emergency supply um, connection well wouldn't we want it closest to where the well is going No, um, maybe I'll bring that screen back up, but the intent is that if we, yeah, let me bring this, share my screen again here. Yeah, bring it back. Just a second here. I assume it's dictated by the other two water system proximity. Yeah, well, let me show you something in the, the way our water system works here. So I apologize, I'm gonna zoom out. It's gonna look, get a little hard to see probably, but I just wanna clarify right now, all of Gig Harbor North, meaning essentially from 96th Street North, and all of this area in blue is our water main, that is all served by a single water main that comes underneath Highway 16 at 96. If we ever lose that water main, the entire Gig Harbor North area, that upper pressure zone, has no water supply. And so what the intent of this uh, water inner tie was going to do was provide us a way to connect to another redundant uh, water supply, which is either Washington Water or Peninsula Light Company at Canterwood. And so it would be providing water from these water purveyors to the city that if we ever had to disconnect water down at 96, that we'd have another way to supply water to Gig Harbor North. Because the water tank it will only last a short amount of time. I see. I see. It, it, there, it, it, it's an isolated project from the, the well number nine project. I thought yeah. the well number nine was what we were, why we were putting in well number nine is for this redundant. Well, it, it helps, but line. still, it, it does help. But if the, another issue is that if we ever lose water along this section of not only if we lose water to the north pressure zone, because all of our wells are in the south, um, not only if we lose water in the north pressure zone, if we ever lose this water main on Canterwood, the hospital has zero water instantly. So we are looking for another solution to be able to not only provide Gig Harbor North with a backup water supply, but specifically also the hospital. So where is the north tank? I'll zoom in. It's right here. Yeah, that's fine. You don't have to zoom. Okay. And where do you think well nine will go? Right around here, right around the north tank. Okay. So while that, that would supply extra water, it still doesn't solve the problem of getting water to the hospital. Correct. It, it doesn't. Um, so if we if we can't do an inner tie with those two water companies because they just can't provide the supply, what is the other option? Well, I'll let Trent jump in on that one. Okay. Well, in general, um, this gets back to a, a fundamental that we strive for in water distribution systems that we call looping. And mm -hmm. you probably all heard that com or that 
that term used. We don't want um, a water system that dead ends because because of this practicality. So we we desire looped systems so they can be fed from at least two directions. So anyway, this this inner tie concept was to provide that um, by way of of two adjacent water purveyors. They both of them were on board. When we initiated this conversation with them, they said, this sounds great. Um, they understood it was emergency only. Um, there is a big difference with Department of Health um, in terms of an emergency inner tie versus a supplemental inner tie. This right. was emergency only. Um, so uh, the intention we, was- we, Hang on, hang on. We seem to have yep. lost uh, Council Member Franich. Oh. I'm assuming he's going to hopefully jump back on here in a moment. I'm keeping my eye on it. Marine, can you pause the recording? This, uh, this internet connection has been a little bit unstable. I apologize. Okay. No worries. Okay, okay. what was the last thing you heard, Jim? <laughs> uh, the fact that uh, we were working to uh, get the inner tie with Washington Water and Rainier. Okay, so uh, we were talking about how you want to have looped systems and i'd ask what is the alternative and jeff was starting to get into that okay thank actually you i think trent much. was getting into that yeah trent if you want to jump in from there okay so yeah we started talking about the importance of looping our water system for redundancy we don't like dead end mains like there is on uh canterwood because if if one direction is cut off, then you're really cut off. If you loop the system, at least you can provide two different directions to serve um, the same area, same system. So both of those uh, purveyors, Washington Water and Penn Light Water, are completely on board with this idea. They understand that it's a uh, emergency only um, inner tie. Um, and so they, they were good to go. And then we got into the nuts and bolts and said, okay, we each, each of us need to respectively figure out the hydraulics of our systems to determine how this inner tie will function. And so that's what's been going on um, this year through 2021. Um, and just to cut to the chase, uh, we can talk about whatever details you guys want, but um, cut to the chase, Washington Water Company has determined they could provide approximately 123 gallons on average, 123 gallons per minute on average per day. However, they've also defined there's certain hours of a day of each day, they could not provide any water to our system through this inner type. Peninsula Light said, we'd love to do something, but we're very hesitant. We've got concerns with capabilities of our system. We cannot provide you any. Um, bottom line being, the inner tie uh, feasibility is 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 rocky at, at best. Um, there's a potential for us to have an inner tie. They're both willing to do it. It would be emergency basis, but it would not be um, really significant enough to provide even what the city's average day demand of 270 gallons a minute. Yeah, man, and that's what the memo says. What are the options? What else can we do? I mean, so options, the options are, are significant. Um, one, is, and they're both identified in our water system plan way out um, in the 20 year uh, portion of the plan. So not within the 10 year of the 2018 plan. However, four years have gone by. So they potentially are within a 10 year plan. And they are to either extend the water main within usage up to Zamel Drive and across SR16 
somewhere around uh, Burnham Drive area potentially and okay. uh, connect. So currently our water main ends on Busage Drive right next to Zamel Drive, uh, right at the high, uh, Fire District 5 entrance. Yeah. And so it would be extending it to Zamel, along Zamel, and then uh, I, I'm not clear, Trent, maybe you are. Yeah. It's either going to go down to Burnham and cross here or cross the Burnham at the overpass, but I don't think it crosses the overpass. I think it bores underneath Highway 16. Yeah, that's that's yet to be determined, but to cross the, you know, put another crossing in to connect to the system in Canterwood, that direction. The other, the other option would be from the neighborhood, and I forget what it's called, up at the uh, um, north end of yeah, Bering Street is actually what's been identified to extend a main from Bering across the TPU right of way and uh, connect to um, the system around the hospital. Well, that's a lot more cost effective, isn't it? Uh, the Bering mm. Street connection is more cost effective. Um, the the, the only benefit that has is it helps the hospital. That's it. The yeah. other solution to come up along Zamel and cross Highway 16 provides redundancy to the entire Gig Harbor North area. Because the the one that comes up Zamel and Burnham and crosses 16 is an, a 12 inch pipe, right? Right. And it will make a redundant connection between the west side of Highway 16 and the east side of Highway 16. Well, and then the one coming off of Bering is a eight inch uh, pipe. And the capacity of a pipe is not just a straight line. It's not like a 12 inch pipe has more capacity than an eight inch pipe. It, 12 inch pipe has a double or triple, if I remember the numbers correctly, the capacity of an eight inch line, right? Yeah, generally, yeah, that's, that's about right. Yep. So you provide a whole lot more service and redundancy by moving that 12 inch line up than moving the eight inch line over. And if you put the eight inch line in, if we still lose the 16 at highway 16, we still don't have a water source, a redundant Correct. water source. If you put the one in Zamel in, when we lose the one at 96, we then have a redundant water source. It's not a big right. issue. So I would guess the, the elevation of the one from Samuel would would help out in terms of hydraulic pressure. It you're 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 up there quite a ways when you get up to the intersection of Yukovich and and, and uh, Samuel. Um, yes, but it it's all in the same pressure zone. So oh, okay. So it, it, that that part really wouldn't matter. So the um, the, sec the second option that Trent mentioned coming off bearing th that doesn't get you to the redundancy is that it doesn't re get you to the redundancy for gig harbor north it only provides redundancy to the hospital if the line for the hospital from the um, roundabout is somehow uh, cut yeah yeah, yeah. Right, but the, the whole idea of this is if we lose the one on 96th street isn't that the the problem we're trying to sidestep yes it, the is. big problem yes yeah the big problem but they're also the other one was what happens if we just lose this section of water main in canterwood boulevard even if we have a redundant source then we still uh, to your harbor north we still need a redundant source to the hospital where's the water source for peacock hill come from uh Washington water wells. I don't know exactly where their wells are. Well, no, I mean, does it, the, like those in the city limits, like Vern Hartson, and doesn't that come from the city park? Mm, uh, no, because that's in, um, only in lower Vern Hartson does it come from the city park because that's in the lower pressure zone. Upper part of Vern Hartson is in the upper, it's actually in the 450 zone. It's in the same exact zone. Okay. Yeah. The, and just for clarity, the pressure zones that we're talking about, we we can literally provide water to a lower pressure zone from a higher pressure zone, but we can't go the other way without in general. So, without constructing a booster pump station. Right. And so, so that's really, yeah. Well, so, I think that a 
if our original objective was to have a backup for all of Gig Harbor North, my feeling is we should stay on that track, okay? Even though the, the cost differential, I'm sure, is substantially different. Um, the, the service to St. Anthony's was sort of a, uh, um, an added feature called, oh, by the way, included in this Borgen Boulevard corridor area is obviously the, the hospital. So it seems to me if we're true to our original objectives on this thing that we should be looking at the at servicing the whole area at, on a backup basis. The other thing is from a uh, <clears throat> boy from a commercial basis, uh, turn the water off of there and I don't know how many million we lose in a day. Uh, that's a huge area, massive mm -hmm. area. And I, and I realize we're talking, you know, life and limb type stuff with regard to the hospital versus dollar and cents down there. But I, I think the way it was originally pitched is we'd get both uh, service along the B Borgen uh, corridor in addition to um, uh, St. Anthony's. That's just my opinion, but I, I, I think it would be uh, a little difficult to uh, to walk this thing back to St. Anthony's only. That's my feeling. Well, let, let me focus on on a few things here. First of all, well number nine is the one that we were talking about and we'll be talking more about later on in the meeting that serves this area is in the pressure zone. Um, that we're proceeding with regardless of the situation because we need a new well source, mm -hmm. right? So if we install, we proceed and we install well number nine, um, let's just say that that's a given. And so that cost is sunk. Sorry for the pun. And so the, if the other option, after we have well number nine in here, if then we have a new water source for Gig Harbor North. Uh -huh. And then the less expensive option would be directly to connect from uh, Bering Street back behind across TPU to the hospital. So, so well, well number nine becomes the, the, the backup that we were looking for, that it, capability. It becomes the redundancy we're looking for. Awesome. And where does, where, where does the water for North Gig Harbor come from? How do you fill the North Tank? Uh, it's well number 11, which is just south of the Public Works Operations Center. Okay. Sounds reasonable to me. What, what is the cost for a booster pump uh, set up? Uh, I'm not sure. Do you have a, any idea, Trent? No, I don't really have one. Um, you know, I, it'd be a wild guess. Of course, it depends on what, what, the, what you're trying to accomplish with it, you know? Yeah. So let's well, remember also that um, we're, we're supposed to be in line for a, an earthquake. We're overdue. So is one of these options uh, better for, than another in case there is a, a problem with water delivery? Um, I would say, well, I would say initially just no. Um, having a well source in Gig Harbor North and a connection from Bering Street across the hospital uh, provides equal redundancy to putting in, in fact, if anything, better redundancy than to put an entire brand new water main in Zamel Drive and bore it underneath Highway 16. And the reason I say that it, uh, is that then we not only have a another way to get water, a redundant way to get water into Gig Harbor North, but we have another water source. If we put a, if we lose one of our wells in the south end we could wheel water though it would take a while from well number nine to the south side end of gig harbor because all the piping would be there but hmm, okay um so right now if we're going to assume that we are going to set aside any efforts we've made on the emergency water inner tie and just look at options other than that 
assuming we do move, continue to move forward with well number nine, the most reasonable solution, in my opinion, would be to move forward at the same time with the water main extension between the hospital and Bering. Was it Bering Street, Bering Avenue? So, yeah, Loop? doing that at the same time we do well number nine. Yes. And is is there a little little road there I can see? Um, That's the Cush the Cushman the drill. Power no, 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 I'm talking power about right right on Bering Street uh, right. on the graphic where it says uh, DI eight inches. Yeah, there is a. So you would go through that little. Um, that's more of a truck. It says Barkley Lane. Yeah. Is that actually a city street or is that a private road? That's a city street. Oh, so no, we, I'm sorry. No, that's a private road. That's Harbor It Crossing. says joint use driveway. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, so we'd have to go get a um, easement from them. Yes. I mean, the, the, the actual location hasn't been identified, but roughly that's probably where it would go. Okay. Cause it makes sense. <coughs> yeah. Makes well, sense. is the idea of abandoning, are you thinking of abandoning the water tie at this time then? I would say yes, given that uh, one purveyor can't provide any and the other one can only provide what almost a third, a little bit less than half of what we need and not at all ours. So right. it's, that's almost it's basically useless to us. And well, 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 I mean, you know, we, I don't even want to say it to jinx it, but since we're having this discussion, what, what would be a, a catastrophe happens? And you know, it's a lot different for, um, I, I didn't do the math in my head. If we can only use 20% of the, however many million gallons you said are in that tank, I don't know how many days that gets for the residents, oh, but um, it's, the hospital is a, a life and death situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it we would have to go through some scenarios and figure out what that would be. I mean, worst case scenario, we could, we would, if we had an issue and we lost that water main, now let's just say we lose the water main in Cannerwood Boulevard. So the hospital is isolated by itself. Um, you'd have to truck water in. I don't know how else you'd get there. And they're not set up for that. They're not set up to truck water in and connect to the water system. But so, if we had the bearing, then, then they would be taken care of. Is that what this is? Yes. Got it. But but I uh, no so, in a catastrophe before well number nine happens. Yeah. And before it, it, we, we'd have to we'd have to truck water in. I don't know how what else this would be. I mean, these are conversations we should be having with the hospital now. We should have had these when the hot before the hospital was built. Yeah. But, yep. but, I'm, but I'm assuming time wise the, the bearing well, number nine solution is competitive with the the alternative on the other side of 16 in terms of implementation timing called from, from starting like right now, okay? Well, well, number nine is going to take longer to construct, in my opinion, than it would to put a water main in from Zane, or from Busich to Highway 16. Maybe not, I don't know, Trent, what you, it, it'd be close. Why is that? Um, it would be a challenge to put the plans together. It would just be time consuming to put the plans together and to get permission from WashDOT to go under Highway 16. Yeah. Oh, no, why would it take longer for well number nine? Oh, uh, because we have to get, we have to get Department of Ecology approval to withdraw water from there. And we would have to get a contractor in there to drill the well and do that entire process. Um, I'm talking, I'm talking years, months. It, it would be over well over a year, I think. Yeah. Okay. How, how about two years? I think we could do it within two years, including getting the water right. Including get well, it's it's and we'll get that. into that in the next the next item, but it's a non-additive water right. Right. And so we have we have to borrow water rights from ourselves. We re reallocate is essentially. Well, that's so actually we just really. We, I assume we, it'd be a reasonable bet then. I mean, if we've if we've been living in sin for how many years the 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 hospital's been there and we have not had a redundant capability in that period of time, uh, another uh, year or two to get the thing we want 
it would seem to me would make a lot of sense. That's just my reasoning. But I mean, if we move forward, how long would it take? You know, I'm really surprised we're even still talking about this inner tie because we've been talking about it for so long. What is the time frame if we move forward with the water tie? That something could happen quickly? The inner tie to Baker? Well, we could probably build it in uh, 2022. But you know, it's but it doesn't do the job. It it doesn't. But but, yeah, it but doesn't. It, it, it's not enough. I understand the 123 isn't enough to do the 270, but it's enough to do the hospital. That's yeah, a that's, that's a valid point. The other part of the that 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 could be what it would come down to is if we did proceed with the inner tie, we would have to negotiate with the other water purveyors that if we had an emergency, the only time we would use that is to supply the hospital. And, and what, was, what, was, what was the cost of the inner tie? For, uh, it's 450,000. Well, I, you know, I'm surprised that, um, is the hospital aware of this? Well, we've told that we told them a long time ago that, that about this, their operations people. So, in, in, and you've never but, received anything back about what their emergency plan would possibly be in a catastrophe. You know, I'd have to go back and and revisit that. It, it was a discussion between our operations person that was here at the time and the hospital. I'd have to go back and, and either talk to those people that were here or do a deep dive to see if I could find any emails. I don't know. I mean, surely they must have some sort of emergency plans. How could you build a hospital without thinking about the unthinkable? Anyway, be nice to know what those plans are. Maybe it's time to revisit that with them, but um, it's, uh, I, I think that's an excellent idea. We need to call hospital administration and set up a meeting as soon as we can. Okay. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that thought. Um, it's, you know, that's why I was asking about the the booster pump. And I, I, I still haven't done the math in my head about how many days that would that would get us. I, I, I you know, who knows what, and I, I don't know, I guess, depending on the nature of if we lost the 96th Street, uh, the main supply, uh, how long that would take to repair is, is really unknown, I guess, because you don't know what the problem could possibly be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would. It would take. It would take quite a few days. A few so, days. do you have a recommendation, Trent and Jeff? Do you have a recommendation? Well, I, I would. I would say that we can touch base with the hospital about their contingency plans. Assuming what I recall from years ago was true, they didn't have one, is then we can look at what it would take to just have the water inner tie serve the hospital and then proceed forward regardless with well number nine, which is in the 2022 budget. And then uh, consider the bearing water main extension over to the hospital. Do we know what the hospital's uh, need is for water? What, how much of our water do they use per minute? Yeah, I don't know if Chris, um, you present your modeling. Yeah, we do have some, uh, some average demands and I don't have them in front of me, but I, if I'm recalling, well, it was somewhere around 60 to 80 gallons per minute on average. So I think what we do is we talk to the hospital about their emergency plans. We go back to, is it Washington Water who said they can provide us some? Yeah. Uh, and say, here's the minimum that the, the hospital would need in the event that uh, they're cut off for whatever reason. And that if they are cut off, then the inner tie flow would be used only for the hospital and it wouldn't go down to the rest of Gig Harbor North, which means we'd have to go and close a valve off to make sure it's not flowing down uh, into Gig Harbor North. 
And in the meantime, uh, keep pressing forward for well nine. Uh, and I think we need to start looking at that Bering Street alternative as well. And uh, we may end up wanting to do those at the same time. Yeah. So according to our water system plan, just to close the loop on St. Anthony's Hospital, um, their demands are average day demand. That's one criteria is 30 gallons per minute. Maximum day demand is 70. So if we just used a, kind of a worst case, use 70 gallons per minute yeah. um, as the number. Well, and I would hope in the emergency, in the event of a catastrophe, part of the hospital's uh, response would be to reduce their water demand as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. All right. We will reach out to the hospital, continue with our marching orders for well number nine, and then look at the Baltic Street extension. Bearing. 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 Thank you. Okay. By the way, when, just a, a side question. When well number nine comes on, it will service these homes that, 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 that Gig Harbor North area, correct? Correct. Okay. You've already got a tie on the other side of 16 to our existing water system, right? Yes. Aha. We have some redundancy going on here. Uh, if but I the, redundancy, it, the redundancy is a flow from well nine down to other pressure zones. The other pressure zones, this is our highest pressure zone, right? Yes. Yep. So this can provide redundancy going south, but we can't get redundancy going north, essentially. Okay, okay. So the rest of the system for the, the uh, uh, well and, and the reservoir or whatever's over there on uh, Samuel and Dugabit, uh, we can't we can't service them with this well number nine in an emergency. We can hydraulically through pressure reducing valves that connect to the lower pressure zones. We yeah we can go we can go from well nine in the north tower down to the the the, the tanks you're talking about. Well, we can't go back up the other way. Correct. Correct. Okay. okay. But the redundancy of well nine is it could keep. Our north tank filled, right? If we if we lost well 11's filling of the north tank capability. Okay, okay. Well, what, and obviously where I was heading for was mm -hmm. instead of having to have Washington water and everybody else, we'd love to be it'd be great to be internally redundant. That is mm -hmm. all within the Gig Harbor water system. Okay, now that, that'll take a couple of years off the process right there. So. Uh, is well 11 the one that you just put in by the public works shop? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, okay. Um, um, I'm surprised that we're having this in-depth discussion now and we weren't have, you know, we've been talking about the inner tie for a long time and I think we really got to the hardest of things today, so. Um, yeah. it, yeah. it took quite a it took quite a process to get the other two purveyors on board to the extent of doing the hydraulic modeling. That's what's been the delay in actually getting to the nuts and bolts numbers of how will this inner tie work hydraulically? Does it even work? Can can they even provide water? And so we finally got to that point um, late this fall. Well, very good. Okay. All right. I, I sure hate to depend on those water companies, outside water companies. For I agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, great. That was a that was a good discussion. So now we will uh, go on to our second topic, which is well, well number nine, right. water rights and mitigation. Yep. Okay. Trent, you're welcome to leave if you uh, need to, but is it up to you? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Yes. Christmas. Yep. Merry Christmas. Okay. Well, um, hopefully you've 
read the memo that was provided on this topic. Yeah. Um, quick summary is that uh, we have a well that, that we've been talking about in Gig Harbor North that uh, we are looking to install soon. Um, there are no water rights previously assigned to this well. We submitted water rights back in 2000, near 2000. Didn't get through that process because there was a lot of other people in the queue. Uh, the process to get water rights is very confusing. That's a short abbreviated summary of it. And so we have gone through a few different processes to try and help ease uh, the issues with getting water rights, namely USGS uh, groundwater aquifer study. And so what I wanted to share with you today was just, I wanted to show you some of those results from the groundwater aquifer study um, and talk about that a little bit and talk about uh, what it takes to get water rights. And so I'm not looking for necessarily direction, but just to provide an understanding and answer questions on where we're going with this and why it takes longer than what you might think it takes to get to this point. And I can't remember, Jeff, I think I might have asked you this and I can't remember what you said. Back when I was on the council before, there was that scenario where you could buy your way up on the list. Correct. Is that uh, still exist or did that get abandoned? Um, the last time that I was involved in that was around 2008 and it still existed back then. And, and um, what well, because we, we were participating in that program. We were, but when we, got, when we got to the point where we were trying to get water rights for well number 11, because we built a well since 2010, um, well, number 11, we did a totally different process and water rights laws had changed. And so we brought in a water rights attorney uh, and he helped us get this, what, what's called and uh, identified in the memo as a, as a non-additive water right. So we're going to reallocate water rights within our existing city of Gig Harbor water rights that we're not using fully elsewhere on other wells. So we how did we get the what the water rights for number 11 uh we are using water rights from wells number i think five and six. Oh, okay so it was a reallocation process as well what it, reallocation i don't know if i'd use that word we're we're we're, we're borrowing essentially what we said is gig harbor is going to use x amount of gallons a minute or X amount of gallons a year. They, they, the, the Department of Ecology identifies water rights in two different ways. One is instantaneous gallons per minute, and one is um, how many, uh, what volume you use across an entire year. And so um, what we did was we said, look, we've got water rights that are unused at five and six. We're not going to exceed the total of volume per year, and we're not going to exceed the total withdrawal amount per minute. But we want to use it at other water well sources so we can take the load off of individual pumps, motors, wells, everything else. And so ecology says, okay, if you don't want additional water rights, then yes, you can you can do that. And we still need to go through the water rights process, but that's a much easier process to go through than obtaining new additive rights. Okay. Thanks. And so what we did in 2000 was request essentially what's being called, and then the terms changed also. So it, it got very confusing right around 2009, 2010. We're, we're, we were originally for well number nine requesting new additive rights, but we're not doing that at this point. At some point we will, we will need to do that. But um, right now we're not, we, we have sufficient water rights to get us through the next few years. We can drill num well number nine, we think, and get and convince ecology that we can just reallocate our water rights again, like we did for well number eleven. What is our what is our total water rights? The aggregate all put together. Um, I'll I'll get that. I, I forget. It, it's an acre feet per year. So, and what that is is oh, across an entire acre. 
the depth of one foot, that volume per year. And I, I'll get those numbers for you. It's in a spreadsheet I have. I didn't, I didn't pull that open, but uh, it's like 2,400 acre feet per year or something like that. And it's how crazy. much do we use? Uh, we use, uh, last time, uh, let's see, it was a year and a half ago that I looked. It was, uh, we're using about three quarters of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. A any idea as to when we will absolutely have to have well number nine on board uh, and, and the water rights that go with this thing? For additive water rights? New yeah, water additive rights. Water rights. Uh, I think the estimation in the water system plan was in 2028 or something. Wow. 29. It's coming up. That's quicker than I thought. That's yeah. quicker than I thought. But by the way, I'm sitting here thinking about Vision 2050. You can't put new things in if you can't give them water and you can't fight fires without water either. Uh, this, is, this is getting to be an interesting discussion. Keep going. Okay. All right, so I just wanna start by going th through and, and explaining um, a little bit of the groundwater study because groundwater is, is to most people foreign. I mean, you can understand the concept of underground rivers flowing, um, but how and where that flows and where you get your water from is, uh, can be a mystery. Um, and it's a mystery to many people, and it's, but it's what it, ecology bases all of its decision on for water rights. Uh, and ecology has to abide by uh, requirements to not negatively impact stream flows. And those are discussions with our tribal counterparts, ecology, anyone actually. And so we need to be able to withdraw water from a groundwater aquifer, which because that's how the city of Gig Harbor gets all of its ground or all of its drinking water and um, not negatively impact stream flows. And essentially, if we, with, if we had remove water from a stream by withdrawing groundwater, and it, ha it, it doesn't matter how much, we need to mitigate for that. And so we need to know how groundwater is flowing, where it's coming from, where, what basins it impacts, drainage basins, what groundwater aquifers it impacts, and then mitigate for those impacts. And so there's a lot of mathematics, a lot of modeling going on. So I'll just real briefly touch it. Yes, Councilor Wu. Is this on top of the groundwater or under the ground streams that we're talking about? I'm talking about underground. If I say okay. groundwater, it is below the ground surface. Okay, great. That's what uh, I thought. I just wanted to double check. I'll try and be clear that streams and surface water are above ground. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to quickly look at... As you're pulling that up, Jeff, um, so I, I'm assuming that through ecology's, uh, <laughs> yeah, through ecology that they have determined that these impacts to streams, which are obviously above ground, the aquifers, some underground water is coming up somewhere out of the ground to feed streams. And that's how they are, you know, because obviously, as Council Member Wood pointed out, groundwater is water that's under the ground. So anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not a hydrogeologist, but it, the way I can try and describe it without having big visual uh, shots to show you, uh, pictures to show you, um, is that w when, you, when you have water flowing in a stream and if there is, you can see it's like a cone. So the water around the stream is in a cone. And if you pull water from down below that cone, you're slightly adjusting what that cone shape looks like. And so once you slightly adjust it, you're, you're adjusting the flows of the stream. You're, you're, the, the, the water starts to seep down into the ground instead of go through the stream. But my point is, is that ecology is determined that these aquifers are somehow feeding these above ground streams. Our aquifers are being fed by. Yeah, it's, it's actually the opposite, uh, Jim. Yeah. Yes, you're going to have some streams that are, are part of a natural spring where the water is coming up and out of the, the ground. 
but for the most part, what they're assuming is, is your streams are fed by natural rainwater, snow melt if you live up in the mountains, and that if you're sucking the water out from underneath it too fast, it causes the water to percolate faster from the streams and therefore you're impacting the streams. Yikes. Yeah. And that and that's where our, almost all of our wells, not all, but almost all of our wells are in aquifers that are well below ground or that are well below um, the imp, that cone of impact for streams. Which is very good news. Yeah. So there are two levels of aquifers or are there more levels? Oh, there's than more than that. There's, yeah, there's, there's multiple, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly share just one or a couple screenshots. So again, as noted in the memo, um, oh, can you see that okay? It's yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is a 2014 report based on the initial report findings for, from USGS when the city participated in this Kitsap County groundwater model. Um, so that's the cover. What I wanted to show you was just a quick snapshot it's hard to see, but I just want to show you, these are the public, publicly operated wells that we used in the groundwater aquifer study. So you can see in the Gig Harbor Peninsula, hundreds of publicly operated wells. Most of them are Washington water wells, honestly. Okay, so that's that. Now I'm going to jump to some of the results. Where? Okay, here's the final report in 2016. And this is, I have all of this if you ever want to read through it, but it's pages and pages. What I wanted to show here, and I can zoom in to make it a little more easier to see, but the purple is City of Gig Harbor water withdrawals and wells. Can you see that closer now? Is that showing on the screen? Yes. You can see how far away some of our deep wells draw water from out on the Key Peninsula. Now these wells are a thousand feet deep. They're below the level of car inlet. Wow. So, um, but it takes many, many years uh -huh. to travel this distance. But this is why we're talking about impacts with ecology to basins that might seem like they're not connected. And remember the Gig Harbor North well number nine is up here. And so it's gonna be pulling just from what you see here, it's gonna be pulling water from, I can't pull, from well up north of Burley area, south and so to the Southeast, just based off this groundwater modeling. But there's a ridge you can kind of see, uh, don't mean to get into too much um, physics, but you can see there's a ridge somewhere. So at some point, the water, that, a, a drop of water that goes into the ground somewhere along here splits. Some of it goes this way, some of it goes this way. And so that's what's going to be defined, and that's going to be the area of impact that we need to mitigate for when we talk about water rights. One just of the way, just as, a, yeah, sorry, just as, a, what is the green? Uh, the green is City of Bremerton Wells. Okay. This, this uh, pinkish color is West Sound Water Utility. And the red is Washington Water. Hmm. So I just wanted to show those to give you an overview of kind of what, how, how we got to where we are and some of, the, what, some of what goes into talking about water rights. So for well number nine, we can drill a well we can go through a very quick process to reallocate non-additive water rights. And then we need to talk about what it's gonna to take to get additive water rights. And so just because we drill a well, if we drill a well, we go through the project in 2022 and we start drilling a well by the end of 2022 and get it online before summer of 2023, doesn't mean the process is over. It means we've got a short-term fix and we've got a, we, it helps us with a couple of operational issues, but not all of the future issues. And so we're going to be coming back to council and we're going to be looking for, and, and this is very special uh, laws that were, and, um, and uh, uh, cons private professional services that we're going to be getting uh, water rights attorneys to help us with this. And it's not going to be by the city attorney, it's probably going to be by a group you've never heard of before, um, but they're going to help us 
with identifying how much water we need for future water rights, because it used to be, you'd say, okay, well, the city would like a large amount of water rights for the for future 20 year growth. Ecology is not giving that. They'll give you a little bit for the short term and see if you actually perfect it, meaning you actually do a total withdrawal of that. If you do perfect it, then they'll give you a little more. They're not gonna give you more unless you absolutely need it. And so, We'll work on that. How much will we need? When will we need it by? And then we're going to have to mitigate because once we start pulling the water out of the streams, we need to be adding water back into those streams to mitigate. So we don't get in the summertime extremely low flows in the stream because of all these aquifers sucking down, repulling down out of the uh, through the layers of soil uh, and reducing the stream flows, which in, in uh, impacts salmonid and the whole cycle of salmon spawning and uh, fry development. So um, it's a much bigger picture. How do you it, mitigate? Um, some you can either let's say uh, let's say we're pulling a thousand gallons a minute out of the our well number nine. Well, somewhere in our system, wherever our hydrogeologists and ecology and the tribes agree, wherever the impact is the greatest, we would put. Let's, let's just say it's um, the very north end of, in our example, this is not at all the case probably, but just as this example, we pull water out of uh, well number nine, which is right near the Gig Harbor North Tank. Then um, we would put into surface water stream flows. Um, and we've got a thousand gallons coming out of well number nine. We put in 10 gallons a minute coming out of a, into a stream flow at, um, in the wetland complex in and around Gig Harbor North, just south of uh, Heron's Key. So we just start dumping 10 gallons a minute in there, for example. But do, do from you, where I, do we I, dump the 10 gallons a minute in there? From the city's water main. So we withdraw 1,000 gallons a minute and we discharge back into the stream 10. Another way of doing it is to put in uh, a reclaimed water facility and start putting in from a sewer. And we're, we've already identified through a phase one reclaimed water assessment that we did. I, Jim, you were probably on the council back then. Yeah, so it's been a while since we did that. We're supposed to finish that study and, and narrow it down from three locations to one and then put some conceptual designs and cost estimates together. That's phase two of the reclaimed water study. And we really need to get on that soon, but it's been set aside for a while. And so we could take reclaimed water from a, a, a tertiary a wastewater treatment plant. It's a class A water and put that into streams. But ecology would have to approve that. And ecology isn't there, my understanding, though that's why we get an attorney involved, that we could use that reclaimed water to mitigate for water rights. Well, uh, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll let them take the first drink out of the purple pipe, but um, you know, you just show the map of where these aquifers are. And it just, the, this is one of the things that frustrates the, the heck out of me with government is, but by these extra additive water rights that we're getting, we're not drawing from any local stream beds, but we're, they, you know, they're gonna allow us to dump water back into a stream that we're not actually impacting. Um, by rights, we would be having to be dumped water in, you know, north of Alala by the looks of that map that you just showed. So the the whole, uh, uh, I don't even know what I'd call it, the, the exercise that the ecology went through doesn't seem to bear weight. If we're pulling from an aquifer that's located in Burley and they want us to dump water into Donkey Creek, how, how does that help the aquifer where we're getting the water from? Uh, you're right, it might not, and they might not let us. That's just my uh, example. They might say, City of Gig Harbor, if you're gonna drill a new well in Gig Harbor North, you're gonna negatively impact uh, greatly uh, Burley Creek. And so you need to drill a well up in Burley Creek and discharge X amount of gallons a minute from that groundwater into Burley Creek. And so we might have to go outside of our jurisdiction. I don't know. I, I've, I've never gone down this path before. Um, 
So it's going to be, I'm going to have to reach out to my colleagues and get a water rights attorney together. And we're going to have to figure out the solution on how we're going to get to that point. Well, it's just seems to me that this is more of um, crazy state uh, regulators um, run running wild. So uh, the I, I won't be here to rail against it much longer. So well. I understand um, trying to play or, or move forward with acquiring water rights is very challenging with all of the regulations involved. Um, I, I, I completely agree. It doesn't always make a whole lot of sense. Um, Maybe we need to reduce our demand on water. Oh, the one minute shower lady. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm not, thinking about, <laughs> I'm not thinking so much about showers as I'm thinking about houses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but it is a very, uh, I'm sitting here thinking, this is a really interesting problem in the Pacific Northwest with a lot of water coming down from the sky, water all around us and everything. And it just begs the question, how do southern states in arid areas deal with these things other than almost wars i think from what well, i've seen uh, that, that's a big part of it there are wars yeah. and if you've ever been to yuma arizona and you see what the colorado river looks like before that it doesn't get to, it doesn't get to the sea of cortez anymore yeah no, because everybody's so taking I, the water out of it bob i can tell you stories about the water wars in in phoenix i was there for 11 years oh yeah <laughs> Then you know. And I mean, I, I had people working for me whose only job was to drive around and uh, deal with people who were wasting water. Wow. So wow. Say, think the landscaping systems that aren't working right, uh, leaky pipes, uh, a whole variety of things. So this could be a real a constraint to, uh, to growth. It, it certainly can be. Oh, I see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, Jeff, didn't we didn't we have a water more didn't we have a more a moratorium over not having enough water in the early two thousands? Yeah, I believe it was two thousand four. I wasn't here, but does that sound right, Mo? I know we had wastewater. Yeah, no. Moratorium. In two thousand four, I thought we had. Uh, yeah, I thought you had a moratorium and... because you couldn't provide sewer capacity for a while. Well, yeah, that we, we, had, we had that as well. Yeah, that was. But I thought we also had a water issue. Yeah, I want to say that was 2004, and that's how we got well number six. Okay. Because well number six was drilled right around then, right around 2004. Well, I, uh, as Councilmember Hines pointed out, uh, we've got more water around than Carter's got pills and uh, the maniacs in down at the state are, uh, you know, they, they can't make anything easy. You know, it's always got to be a battle. So, um, well, I, I, I'll, I can, I'm happy to share these reports with you. They show trends in aquifers and right. it, it's it, just because we have very high intensity rainfalls for shorter amounts of time doesn't mean our aquifers are recharging because it takes constant rainfall to recharge aquifers because it becomes what we in engineers call flashy. And so you, you get a lot more runoff and a lot less yep. infiltration. Yep, right. The heavier but, the rain is, the faster it runs off. It doesn't yeah. go where it needs to go. So it's not recharging the aquifers, but we withdraw more water. Well, I haven't looked at a chart of the annual rainfall and its distribution over how many days it, it rained, but. Uh -oh. oh, there he goes. Jim, you've frozen up. And it takes how many years for the water water or the groundwater to get down to the aquifer? Decades. Yeah, definitely. if you're talking about a thousand feet deep, 
Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a long time. That's a long We're time. We're water that, that hit the uh, surface of the earth, I don't know, 1,500 years ago. Yeah, okay. centuries. Wow, wow. By the way, in the in the interlude here, uh, yeah, if you could send me a copy of those uh, those files on the uh, those reports, I may have a little time on my hands and need some easy reading. So <laughs> I'll email it to the whole group. Great. Uh, do you want me to pause the meeting again while he tries to get back on? Yeah, go ahead and pause it. Yeah. We see you back, you Mr. Franich. Thank you. Um, okay, so Jeff, uh, I guess that was just more or less informational. Yep, was. I think uh, there were some questions on uh, in confusion on why we needed to mitigate for well number nine and and water rights in general. So it was uh, uh, follow up educational. On that. Yep. Yeah, and I, I'll just say I did pull up. Uh, I found out uh, the city has six additive municipal water rights. One non-additive, yeah, uh, certificated right, meaning we actually have used all of it, and one water right that's not cert uh, certificated. Sorry. Um, total annual withdrawal from aquifers: two thousand two hundred sixty-five acre feet per year. An that's instantaneous good. withdrawal of four point four five million gallons a day. Right now we're at about on instantaneous. We're I think in that um, I want to say about two and a half or three million gallons a day. Okay, so we've got quite a bit of reserve. Um, we have capacity. I'm going to that. yeah. The, 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 uh, that I'll be reporting back to council in the first part of the next year about this because that that's how much we're actually withdrawing. It doesn't account for how much we've reserved through our water CRC program because we have to be able to reserve it for future developments, and that's that's not shown in this number here. So I'll oh. have those numbers. Uh, well, I'm sorry for those of you who might not be here, but I'll have those numbers in first part of next year. And um, I'm assuming, did this conversation come up with the population allocation numbers? I know it's not your department. I don't know if Tony knows that, or I see Bob's non his yeah. head. This is all new news. That's that's why I was kind of rolling my eyes a little bit. To call, hmm, this is a this is a whole new angle. On the the analysis eventually does come together, but they are generally done on parallel tracks. And once you get to the point of looking at your development capacity, as development occurs, they have to come in and get a certificate of water availability. And at some point, if we don't add more capacity, uh, depending on how far along we are in our, the amounts that we're using either annually or uh, the peak, uh, peak day or peak draw, as, as Jeff was saying, we get to a point like we did with the um, sewer availability where we say we have no capacity to serve you. Well, Council Member Wook, I guess uh, you can keep this knowledge in your pocket uh, <laughs> for when the time comes. Yep. You heard it, Jeff. Yep, you heard it there. And, and, it's, and it's part of the analysis that a subdivision will do is they have to say, here's the amount of water we're going to be drawing. Here's the, the average daily amount. Here's the, the peak hour amount. And then Public Works does have to take a look at that, look at the, where the uh, development is located and say, yes, we can serve you. No, we cannot. Well, in a sane world, wouldn't, rather than these par being parallel, wouldn't Puget Sound Regional Council say that we need to look at this holistically and take all of these factors into account when they're doling out allocations? I think they do some of that, but uh, uh, some of these development proposals are much more localized than they are in a general a gigantic area. Jeff will tell you there are some areas of town where it's a little iffy if we can provide service uh, to a large development and other areas of town where our system is, is very robust and it's not a problem. Yeah. Well, well hey, Jeff, you, just, you just, heard just... it. I would say you heard it from Trent. I mean, that, that Washington water, they can't provide us a drop of water for the morning because their system is at capacity. They're, they're basically no more connections. Yep. Is, 
is to do you know and this has nothing to do with us but do you happen to know does tacoma have plenty of water yes as long as they continue to get it from the river sources right. yes yeah. now but if you probably know you if you've seen this you the tacoma water has backup well reservoirs well backup waters yeah water, drink, well, drinking wells. water wells they take it from the groundwater in the summertime because they can't keep pulling out of the rivers. This is bringing back my memories, but um, Nestle built a big bottled water plant in northern Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the effects of that went out many, many miles. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, one county, it, it really devastated, yep. literally. The uh, the water table, okay, and it it big court. I mean, it was really a big deal, huge deal. Okay, people had no. Some people didn't have water literally. They had water originally, uh, that type of thing. So it sounds to me like we don't have to worry about Nestle uh, water plants here in uh, King Harbor. You know, no. we're uh, depending on well water. So we can cross that one off the list. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks. Uh, that was uh, another good discussion. So I guess we'll uh, briefly go over the capital uh, improvement project list. Sure. Yeah. Let me share my screen. I'm just going to go over tiers one and two. Those are really the more places we had major uh, adjustments. I mean, they weren't significant, but uh, tier one. Here we go. Can you see that okay on your screen? Can you blow it up just yeah. a little bit? Yeah. Let me see here. Did that make it better or worse? It didn't make any effect on mine anyway. No. All right. How about that? No. no. Just go with it. Yeah. OK. Sorry about that. I don't know why it's not changing. So um, railway carriages, no changes, community paddler's dock. Uh, we extended that out uh, to the very end of the construction window. We originally thought we were with the contractor would be out on site doing the work before Christmas. Uh, it's not going to happen. He's going to be out uh, just after New Year's to start on that project. So extend that one out. Who's doing uh, that project? American, American Construction out of Tacoma. Okay. Not to be confused with Advanced American Construction, who is also a Marine contractor. Okay. Uh, Austin Estuary Honoring Symbol. I put in more detail. We, we now are in the Department of Archaeology, Archaeology and Historic Preservation process. I put that in there. Um, they told us that it would take at least 60 days to get through. So 80 is all the prep work that we did. And, and, and just as a reminder, we, we found a shell midden out there. You found a what? A shell midden. So, some, something of archeological historic value. Okay. Mm. But did, but, wow. Well. Uh, I, I won't go ahead. Uh, so they pushed all, all of those dates out. And so we're looking at uh, doing construction in February with installation after that in the beginning wow. of and the Essentially what it did is rather than have the base that the carving goes on go deep into the ground, it's now going to just go a few inches into the ground, but it's going to be much wider. So the midden is not disturbed. And, and actually the final uh, design from that was recommended by the Puyallup tribe was it's actually two inches. The base is now two inches above the existing ground. Oh, that's right. That's right. We, we, we actually have to build the mound up a bit and then yep. put the base on it. Yep. All right. Uh, moving forward. Human powered watercraft storage design just brought that into the uh, time frame we have now. Yeah, it, you didn't move forward. We didn't. The screen is still the same. Oh. What is going on? Oh, it's paused. Wonder why. There we go. Oh, oh that's even help. better. I can now read it. Now it's clear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I must uh it might I paused it somehow. Sorry. Okay, uh, just jumping down to city buildings, the HVAC system. Um, I was hoping to have something to counsel by December 13th uh, for a consultant contract. It didn't happen. So now I'm moving it forward to the 10th, hopefully in January. Hey, Jeff. Yes. On that one, you know, I, I to be honest with you, I, I 
very rarely ever really looked at this very closely. Why was the consultant selection 204 days? Because we started it in March and then we paused it because I didn't get back to it. That's why. Okay. That's, that's the from the time we essentially what happened is Marty and I started to dig into what the needs were. We put together a document that, that Marty handed me and then I haven't been able to advance it because of other priorities. Okay. Now there's that, that magic window. How close was the end of the magic window to that 317 date? I'm sorry, which project are you talking about? I'm, I'm looking about the Anchish, uh, what human powered waterfront storage design. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Right there. That one right there. Uh, what was your question again? How close are we to what? Well, the, the, you got fabrication and installation, okay. Uh, oh, that's storage. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm out in the water. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Oops, we jumped ahead too far. Uh, Public Works Operations, uh, we have submitted our building permit. Um, we're waiting for final plans to go along with the building permit that we submitted. Uh, we hope to be bidding in January and awarding a contract the last council meeting in February. It will be nice to get that building completed it and will. done. It will. Yes, it will. Uh, Stinson Avenue, that's just continuation. We're still waiting for final uh, items from the supplier. Uh, Burnham Half Width, this was updated recently. And so it is showing that we're going to be uh, finishing design permitting this spring. So, Jeff, on, on that one there, I, I, and I just noticed this today, if you look at that date of 1 1 21 to 5 26 of 22, yes, you got, you got under duration 365 days, but somehow there's 150 days that aren't accounted for there. Those are all working days. The duration on this is all working days only. So it takes out weekends and holidays. So, but why is it, does the start, the start date and the finish date don't add up to 365, they add up to like almost 500? Because it's 365 is how many working days you have. So that's Monday through Friday, less holidays. And the, and the, and the start to finish is calendar days. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. I, yeah. Okay. Well, that answers the question on the next page too, because there was the same thing where I was looking at this. Yeah. Comment. These these dates don't add up to the amount of days. So you're you're right. They don't. And and I apologize. That's just the the, well, the way engineers look at. Schedules. I was going to say that's engineers. That's yeah. How that's just engineers. Any other group in a city usually only works at calendar days, but engineers, we always look at working days. Very good. Uh, I'm that way, going. we all don't know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> keep, keep them on their toes. Yep. Uh, let's see. The waste arterial plant digester upgrades. Uh, Daryl's crew is under underway with that now uh, for construction. Hmm. Boy, my number's off. <laughs> uh, that's wrong. Construction should start in January. I don't know why it says November 23rd. Something's wrong with my project schedule. Um, and then the culvert on Burnham Drive ma should match the uh, design and permitting for um, Burnham Drive uh, sidewalk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then stormwater utility revenue study, we updated that after our discussion. Um, and then utility rate study just got pushed out because we're not going to get fully into this and get before council until after the stormwater revenue studies out of the way. Okay, I'll jump into tier two, it's really quick. Oh, sorry. Okay. Do whatever you did to the other one for this one. Yeah, so yeah, that didn't help. I see what I did. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, there we go. 
Okay, so uh, native plant vegetation, that's gonna be having, Ken's crew has some of those plants, not all of them already, but they're gonna be planting them uh, just before and just after the new, new year holiday. Uh, sports complex, phase 1B, um, we've got some staff assignments going forward on that one. Um, and we're going to hopefully get a, cons a consultant on board in early January or in January of 2022. And then we'll be moving forward with construction by the end of 2022 and through 2023. And then Donkey Creek Daylighting, um, this is just something we're hope to get a, a study session with council and users, uh, um, fishermen, Harbor Wild Watch, anybody who has interest, Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, in January to have that discussion. And, and then and we've, been, design. and we've been working on getting those people uh, figured out and invited and find a date for that. So, yep. and that is something that council have asked us to do. And so we are working with them. So I think that was it for, yeah, that's it for that, for tier two. And then come 2022, we're gonna have a brand new set of uh, CIP schedule and updated from there. Thank you. So, so I assume some of the things that we, we had in there like um, uh, Burnham half width and particularly 38 between Hunt and and uh, 56th Street will will uncover those on the on the time spans here. Start yes. to see the, the beginnings of those babies. Yep. And right now everything is in all projects are in one large CIP schedule, and then we'll break those out as we proceed into 2022. Okay. And home port, I didn't see that on there anywhere. Hmm. Let me see. I thought it was on tier. Maybe I missed it. it I, I, it's a good question. It's not on here. Yeah. Okay. Um, you're, you're correct, but it, it, given where we're at with the council and the budget needs to be moved up to at least tier two, if not tier one. Yes. Apologize for that. Sure. Does the that timing... get moved up at uh, retreat? Is that how that happens? Well, or it's, it's already in my 2022 CIP with um, consultant award for design and permitting at the end of January. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It, it, uh, Tony, um, yeah. any word on uh, uh, all the wonderful uh, free money that's mortgaging our kids' future? Uh, nothing yet other than the, we need to wait for the, uh, the Congress and, the, and in particular the Senate to figure things out. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they move in mysterious ways in, in D.C. They have these black boxes that they keep grinding through for about six months, and then all of a sudden, boop, out pops everything, and we all kind of wonder where the hell that come from. <laughs> Amen, brother. Um, so uh, any public comment? No, but I did want to bring something up. Oh, I, no yeah, comment. I was going to get to that. Okay. No, no public comment. Okay, Council Member Wook. Thank you. I, I do want to bring something up because of the uh, because of the monument in Soundview Forest Park, and uh, because the parks is coming is under public works. Do we have a policy for um, monuments or plaques that go in public parks, and how they get done, and who looks at what's on the plaque? We don't have a policy. The general um, general procedure has been it's a combined effort between public works and administration to identify those plaques. Some of some plaques are required by grants, and others are just uh, nice to have suggestions. Tourism and communications, along with um, Chamber of Commerce and others, other groups, including the Historical Society, they all participate. And it's uh, more of a discussion between public works and administration about those. So I don't remember seeing anything in public works about what's on this plaque that's going in this park. Uh, I think it should actually, I, I don't know, I think we need to have a policy about that. 
and, yeah. and maybe it needs to come before council to look at what's going to be on these plaques that go in public areas. It, it yeah. seems like anybody can put anything on a plaque they want. And I, I would agree with that, council member. And what I will say is, I'll be honest, when you brought up your concern about that, I was a little surprised because everywhere I've ever been, whenever you have a building, a project, whenever you have an opportunity to put a plaque in that lists the name of the project, the members of the council who were uh, who approved the final product, um, generally put the city manager, the parks or director or the public works director, the name of your design engineer, your construction company, and then any of your funding uh, partners, and that's where Jeff was coming in. Some of the funding partners demand that you put a plaque up that says, hey, RCO provided funding for this project. So every place I've ever been, uh, that's the way the plaques are put together. So there's no question as to what goes on them. But since we don't have a policy here, I, I strongly support bringing this question to the council and decide what do you want on your plaque? And if if we have a required one, again, from something like RCO, then we will put the minimum on there so RCO is happy and we don't have them say, hey, give us our money back. And and I can say that, for example, following up on Mr. Prasecki's comment is Port of Tacoma said that with the, and it says it in the grant agreement that was just approved by council last night, says that there has to be a plaque. Uh, and so we're going to be putting a small plaque acknowledging that some of the funding has come from Port Tacoma. Now, when you brought up that email, Councilman Baruch, I started to think back, if it's not been a requirement, has the city ever put a plaque up? If it has, it's been rare. If you look at the Welcome Plaza, now, now when things are donated, let's say the Rotary built the, uh, it, down at um, Scansy Park, they built the pavilion. Yeah, that's identified. But, um, but if it's just a capital project that the city builds, I can't think of any off the top of my head where there's a plaque that uh, that has the names of the people who are involved, the designers, if it wasn't a requirement of a funding partner. So I do think we need to have some sort of policy. And, and with regards to this plaque that's going to go up, I think that the council should have a say in what's on it. Is that out of the range to ask for that? I don't think so. Then I will talk to the mayor about what's going on. The plaque that is in question right now. Okay. Yeah. And so I guess then at the, one of the council meetings coming forward, or maybe at the retreat, maybe this is a good place to, to bring up the idea of a policy for a plaques that go, that go up in our city. Um, we need, we need to have something. So some, so things don't happen in the dead of night. So, so we'll work with uh, uh, the mayor elect and mayor when she is uh, in office through our normal process of getting things scheduled for council discussion. And I see we lost uh, Mr. Franich again. Okay. <laughs> Thank so, you very much. I appreciate sure. that. I'm happy to know that you're going to talk uh, with the current mayor to see what and, and bring forward somehow to council so we we know what's going to be on that plaque. Sure. Yeah. Sounds like a sounds like a reasonable plan to me. Um, in the interim, I got a sign last night. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Where are you going to put your sign, Bob? Uh, no, I don't know. In my, in my workshop next to all my other signs, I got to, I got to convert one wall in my workshop to all these <laughs> mementos. Okay. I will say that at the city of Des Moines, there's at least a half a dozen blacks around town that have my name on them. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, but the one that I, the only one I regularly see is when my wife and I go to the Des Moines Creek Trail, which is right north of the marina and goes up the Des Moines Creek Corridor. We have a great big rock with a very large plaque on it uh, that commemorates when we completed that uh, project. And um, we actually had, uh, I think Senator Patty Murray came out and helped us dedicate that because she'd helped us with some of the funding on that project. Wow. There you go. There you go. So every time I walk by it, I, I point out to my wife, I say, hey, they haven't scratched my name off yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. That's good to know. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. I have not paused the recording yet, but do we think Council Member Franich is coming back to adjourn the meeting or? Um, I honestly don't know. I, I don't think we have anything else. Don't have anything else. 
So why don't we just go ahead and um, adjourn the meeting? Adjourn the meeting if the two uh, members of the committee so agree. In fact, I will tell you what we'll do. I will move that we adjourn the meeting. And I will second, second it. And then we will agree. I turn the meeting. Those in favor? Jenny and yes. And thank All you, right. Bob Himes, Councilmember Hines, for being on this committee and for for your good thoughts and for Councilmember Franich as well. You will be missed and your oh. information and knowledge will be missed. So thanks. Oh, for thank being you. Here. Thank you. It's been fun. Let me tell you. Uh, and challenging and challenging. And I was going to say, you have a fun definition of uh, fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's like putting that sign, you know. Uh, Here we go. Um, all right. Well, well thanks. Uh, thank you all. I'll and, give them uh, And I'm uh, definitely, um, uh, staff, oh. like I said, has been very accommodating with my uh, my uh, press. Member board, Franich is uh, back. Oh. Ah. Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. We adjourned the meeting anyway. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you can stop the recording now. We're just chatting. Okay.